Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind, episode 95. Anytime you get a, any idea that relates to education, just stop for a second and say, now, where does that come from? And is that really necessary? And is it really what my family is all about? Is it what I need for this child in this situation and so forth? And if it's not, you know, lose it. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you're ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Mary Hood. Mary has a PhD, and along with her husband, Roy, she's homeschooled their five children all the way from kindergarten through college entrance. All of them are now adults and have made a successful transition to college and beyond. Beginning in the 1980s, she has spoken and written widely on the variety of topics concerning home education throughout the United States and overseas. She has a PhD in education and is the director of the Association of Relaxed Christian Homeschoolers, a.k.a. Archers for the Lord. She is a regular columnist in the Old School House magazine. For nine years, Mary ran a large resource center for homeschoolers in the Atlanta area where the Archers is based. She's the author of such books as The Relaxed Homeschooler, The Joyful Homeschooler, and The Enthusiastic Homeschooler. Now in her 60s, Mary continues to write and speak widely on the issues pertaining to homeschooling as well as the wider field of education. Her organization is currently trying to raise money to start a small private school and homeschooling resource center in Georgia and is also involved in developing a curriculum guide for relaxed homeschooling. For more information, you can visit at the website archersforthelord.org. Welcome, Mary. Hi, thanks for having me. This is going to be such a fun conversation. When I was looking over your bio, I just thought it fit perfect with what we're trying to do of changing the paradigm of education here on the Lumos Mind. So thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Do you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself and your family? Sure. I have five kids that are all grown now. Uh, They range in age from 24 to 37. And we were one of the first people around to homeschool in the current paradigm of homeschooling in the United States. It was, we started back in about 1983. And uh, we homeschooled all the way through with two very minor detours. Once my oldest son went to public school for just a few months, that was just a unit study in public school. I knew how long he'd last. (laughs) He said he wanted to go and I let him go in seventh grade. And so I, you know, I had plenty of public school in just those three or four months before he came back home. And then my middle son went to a Christian private school for, again, just a few months in eighth grade. I thought he would stay. Uh, it was kind of over the baseball issue at the time. But when he found out he wasn't in charge of the school, he came back too. So <laughs> he's the kind of like person that likes to, you know, take charge of everything that he does. And it just wasn't happening there at the private school. So at any rate, other than that, my daughter, by the way, wanted to go to school also in about ninth grade, and I didn't let her. And it had nothing to do with the boy-girl thing. It was just, for a lot of reasons, I just didn't think it was the right thing for her. So I made a deal with her, basically, and she went off to college early at 16. One of the biggest things that I always emphasize is that when you're homeschooling, or or whether you are or not, you have to treat your kids as individuals, you know, and uh, just, you know, do whatever works for each one of them. And that's one of the main things that I've learned from homeschooling. Um, as, as mentioned, I started in 1983. I, uh, I have a PhD in education. I actually finished that while I was homeschooling. Then I worked with homeschoolers. I taught a little bit at a public university for a while, but mostly I've just worked with homeschoolers all those years. We had a resource center, as you mentioned, in Kennesaw, Georgia for nine years and shut that down about the time my kids grew up, which was in 2006. And then for a while, I did a little detour and I went into the field of real estate. I became a real estate appraiser. And I was working like that very happily. I had no intention of quitting it. And then all of a sudden, about a year and a half ago, I just really felt God tap me on the shoulder and tell me to to knock that off and come back that he needed my help. (laughs) 
<laughs> field of education. So I did. I stopped it and uh, signed up for Social Security early. <laughs> I need some money. And since then, I've mostly been writing and speaking, but we're just starting to try to really get going again on some programs. I do have a few classes uh, supposedly lined up in my home this fall, but I'm actually thinking about starting up a new resource center and possibly even a private school. So at any rate, uh, we're just kind of getting going again after a little bit of a lapse there. My kids are all um, scattered, kind of. My two old, my daughters, I have two daughters. They're both married. One lives in England and one lives in Oregon. Uh, my sons are all still single and hanging around in this area, which is Georgia. Don't have any grandchildren yet, so um, <laughs> sure they're coming. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so that's just the place I am right now is kind of regrouping and figuring out. You know, that's a hard transition. Well, homeschooling moms, I think, have the one of the biggest empty nest syndromes known to man. You know, because oh, I would imagine we're so involved with our kids. So it's been a tough transition. But I just feel like right now I'm really coming out on the other end of it and starting to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of the time I have here on this earth. And I think most of it will still be devoted to the field of education. Well, and it sounds like you started out in education in a way. I mean, did you always plan on homeschooling or did you, was this something that came along later? There was no such thing as homeschooling when I started homeschooling. (laughs) (laughs) There were literally six families in the state of Alabama that homeschooled at the time where I was and they didn't even call it homeschooling. So no, I I didn't plan on that. Uh, I worked loosely in uh, kind of a variety of recreation and educational fields. Uh, when I was younger, I was involved uh, to some extent with a um, free school, you know, back in the John Holt free school movement days uh, in the 50s and 60s. And I was involved a little bit with one of those for a while. But then basically I, um, I, I had my kids and when my son got to be six, I just didn't know what to do with them. So <laughs> I, I decided to you know, keep him at home, and I'm really glad I did. He was the type of kid, I was basically driven to homeschooling to begin with because of my oldest son. He was the type who was very, very advanced in some ways, you know, reading Jules Verne going into, sec- going into first grade. But on the other hand, he was not ready for a sit-down school type experience. And it, I just knew that he was going to be a disaster in a public school setting. So I, uh, I actually read an article the, sat, the Sunday. What had happened, we had just moved from one place to another. And so I had researched, you know, the gifted programs and everything, picked out the best school, moved a block away from it, you know, and just felt like I was all set up until I went and talked to them. And they started saying stuff like, you know, uh, well, if he tests into our gifted program in April, this being an August at the time, um, he will get two hours of extra instruction. In the meantime, it won't hurt him to go over all that again. And I thought, uh huh, you know, (laughs) (laughs) it won't hurt him, but it might you, right? (laughs) So anyway, uh, that's that just wasn't going to work, and so we became homeschoolers early on. My my daughter, the next one after him, was uh, in kindergarten. Those little you know Baptist preschool things, and uh, for a while I left her in there. But then I started getting schizophrenic because you know we Sam and I'd go do fun things go to the zoo or something and she'd have to go go to the kindergarten so after uh, about six months of that I, we were moving from one place to another again and I used that as an opportunity to pull her out of that preschool program and never put her back in if she had been the first one it probably would never have occurred to me because she was the, the classic school kid you know she would have been the teacher's dream and uh, <laughs> you know she's always been very social and so forth and there were times when I worried if she was going to resent the whole idea of homeschooling like I pointed out earlier, she did wind up going on to college at 16. But other than that, I think she's she's now in her 30s. She has a master's in counseling. She's working as a counselor and, like I said, married. She lives in Oregon. So, And I, I think she's very happy at this point that she was homeschooled. But I definitely had to look for social opportunities for her outside the house. Sam would be happy sitting under the apple tree digging in the dirt all day. But Ginny needed... Um, needed things to do you know we, we joined 4-H to talk to and <laughs> exactly and community theater and that was in the days remember too before there were homeschooling opportunities like that and we used all community resources things like 4-H community theater you know some community sports for the boys she was she wasn't into the sports part but at any rate so um so she needed a lot of outside opportunities we gave her that and you know she she came out just fine and then what I found as the kids 
you know, all came along one after another. I suppose early on, people might have thought I was sort of an unschooler. You know, I had been influenced by people like John Holt and the free school movement and all that. But really, that was partly just because that's what worked with Sam, just kind of leaving him alone and reading a lot and, you know, not, not really having school materials and so forth. But then when my middle son came along, he was a very different type of learner, and he wanted to have a lot of structure and books. He had his uh, his library of books when he was six years old done with the Dewey Decimal System, the real one, in his room with little checkout uh, pockets and stuff. And he was just not the sitting in the dirt and thinking about a type. So he's the one that really taught me that it's not so much about what my philosophy is or what I believe about education, but as a mother, to recognize I'm more of a mother than a teacher in this scenario and uh, do whatever works for each one of them. you know. And that was very, very different things for every one of them. My oldest daughter was very mature. Uh, moved on, like I said, to college at 16 years old, 20, she was graduated and living in Korea. You know, she just grew up early. My other daughter, by the age Jenny was going off to to college, she was just barely able to think about high school. In a school setting, she would have been diagnosed all kinds of stuff. I'm sure she would have been ADHD. She's the type that couldn't walk through a room, you know, without doing a cartwheel and that sort of thing. And just wasn't the sit down school type at all. But she really caught up in a hurry during her teenage years. And then she went off to college too. All my kids have been to college. All but one has graduated. The one that hasn't graduated is 24 and he's got about four classes left, but he's the general manager of a Chipotle's restaurant. And that's a very all time consuming job. So he's had a hard time finding time to do those last few classes, but all of them have graduated from school and one of them has a master's. <clears throat> so anyway, they've all done quite well for themselves. So he ended up yeah, being successful despite that. <laughs> yes. And keep in mind that we are relaxed in the sense of that I, I was never standing up at the front, you know, working with full curriculum and, uh, you know, teaching from a certain time to a certain time of the day. We just really lived together, read a lot together, did a lot of projects, that sort of thing, set goals and, and worked on them and so forth. So we, we were not... You know, we did not look like a school. Of course, I did have the resource center for nine years. And there, naturally, you know, when they took classes over there, which the younger ones did uh, sometimes, we looked a little more like a school over there because obviously there were more people around. But especially in the early years, we, we were just a family working at home. Well, and can you tell us more about that philosophy? I was reading a little bit on your website about that idea of the relaxed homeschooler. Just tell us, give us a picture of what that looks like and how that came to fruition in your life. Well, I have taught educational philosophy in a college setting. And I know that, and I, I also have a booklet that I've written, and it, it's kind of, not available right now, but will be again at some point. Uh, I'm trying to change it from paper to digital. Anyway, it's called Countdown to Consistency. And so it's, I think it's extremely important for a mother or parent to figure out what they believe about education, to start challenging their assumptions and all those types of things. But the idea of relaxed homeschooling is not as much a philosophy as, as it is a mindset, which is just that you're a mom. I, there, these are kind of the tenets of it, if you will. You're a mom, not a teacher. You're a dad, not a principal. You have a family, not a school. You have individual children, relationships with them, not a classroom. And what that should free you up to do is to get away from the school mindset of thinking, what do you do in second grade, you know, and what's this full curriculum I have to buy and so forth, and get to the point where you're setting your own goals and living an interesting life. And to me, of course, the heart of education is reading, always has been. So reading a lot together, having interesting experiences. And when you have a specific goal and you need to buy a little curriculum to reach that goal, like, for example, maybe your goal is to get them to be good at basic math and you need a math you know, book to do that or algebra later on or whatever, that you're buying specific curriculum for a purpose and, and with an individual person in mind. And you're getting out of the school mindset of we have to pick this curriculum for our school. You know, we have yeah. to name, name our school. We have to be sure we're on grade level. You know, we have to worry about the results of these standardized tests. You know, we have to worry about what the school system is doing with Common Core. All of that stuff is not things you need to worry about as a homeschooler. You're, you need to, again, get to know your kids really well and uh, establish your own goals for them and figure out what's working and what's not. And just on a daily basis, you know, a, a traditional school has a lot of emphasis on evaluation. Well, we do too, but it's just a different type because on an almost daily basis, you should be asking yourself, you know, what are my goals? Where are we? What's working? What's not? Why isn't 
what's not working work <laughs> and all those types of things and constantly making little adjustments, you know, and being willing to throw away that expensive stuff you just bought if it's not working. Because after all, you know, the goal is not to finish a curriculum at the end of the year. It is, the goal is to turn out children who have good values and who have the skills and, you know, abilities to, to make it in this world. So uh, I talk a lot about things like that in my philosophy. One of the things I do talk about a lot is goals. I break it down a lot into six areas. The areas are, are values and skills. Let me think. Hang on a minute. Values, attitudes, habits, which I'm a big believer in developing good habits. And then uh, skills and that's a big broad category that has not only life skills, academic skills, college related skills and so forth. And then um, uh, individual interests and talents and knowledge. And knowledge is on the list, but it's kind of deliberately in last place. Now, as a Christian, I believe there's a certain type of knowledge, the type that's the beginning of wisdom that belongs up there at the top with values, you know, development. But the type of knowledge like, you know, what's the capital of South Dakota? That's the kind of knowledge that to me is not very important because if you develop somebody who has a can-do attitude and who has the skills to learn things and the motivation and desire to keep learning all their lives, then whenever they need to know specific things, they can find them out you know, in a hurry. So I've never really focused as much on the content of what they're learning as the skills that they're learning and the kind of person they're becoming. One thing that I did read about is that you did talk about some of those skills. What are, what do you feel like? And we talked about our values and then also um, being able to kind of be a self-driven person. What are some other skills do you feel like are necessary for kids or to parents, for parents to really foster in their children? Well, first of all, when I have those six areas, the first three, the values, the attitudes, and the habits, I tend to emphasize before about the age of 12 or 13. And then to me, the skills is where I'm really hitting it hard during the teenage years, uh, as opposed to the knowledge. You know, I mean, I'm not saying we don't do subjects sometimes, but it's it's less important to me that they're learning chemistry, that, that they're learning certain skills, you know, that sort of thing. So of the skills, well, uh, first of all, I've taught college, so I know what they need to go there. And number one thing is the four communication skills, you know, reading and writing and speaking and listening. The reading comes fairly natural to most homeschoolers. The speaking doesn't come naturally to anybody, so you have to help them work on that. When I had a resource center, I had these things called thin, my thinly disguised uh, social studies classes <laughs> were, were, really, <laughs> were really speech classes because they would, I would get, have the kids get up there and give talks and do debates and all kinds of things. And uh, to me, and, and by the way, when I've had not, the resource center has been closed now for almost 10 years, so all those kids that were in it then uh, have been on to college college and beyond most of them and many of them have come back to me and told me that was the most valuable thing that they got there was because they said when they got to college they were already used to going up and and talking you know and giving talks and things and and of course that's not emphasized a lot in most public education these days so so anyway they uh, they really needed that and then in addition to those skills there's all the like you know I mean I could go on and on but there's research skills old fashioned research and the newer computer based research skills computation skills at least, you know, if not higher level math skills, um, writing, you know, commu- well, I said that already, the communication part. And then all the life skills, you know, the cooking, the baking, the woodworking and all that sort of thing. And I would never, ever, ever let any of my kids get to the age of 18 without having some skill that they could use to make a living uh, yeah. if they have to. Because to me, just having a piece of paper that says, hey, I'm educated, it may not get you very far. <laughs> well, and yeah, you see a lot of kids that come out of school school and they think that somehow that, you know, that college education is their magic ticket, (laughs) you know, but having some life skill and and some skills, like you said, to make a living before then gives them experience and then that helps with their, the education on top of that. Also, as somebody who's been in the, in the field of real estate, I know that in, in the uh, business world for a little while, kids today are not prepared, uh, adequately prepared for just the financial aspects of life and for things like real estate. You know, my husband and I made some really stupid moves that, you know, luckily we, <laughs> it turned out okay. <laughs> but looking back, my goodness, you know, and when I was, I was sitting, I, I was a realtor for a little while, mostly I was an appraiser, but I remember I was sitting at this open house and some kids came up. I mean, I call them kids they were in the early 20s that I had just taught at the resource center a few years before and here they are coming up looking at this house that my husband and I wouldn't even attempt to buy you know and then this was just before the real estate crash so you know they're lucky that I basically kicked them out and told them to go away and don't even think about it you know yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, you know, I mean, they, there are so many real life skills that are missing from a classic, you know, type education. And I don't mean classical, I mean, you know, traditional education that people get in the public schools these days and they come out not knowing anything in many cases, you know. So, yeah. it's, uh, you know, I don't even get me started on Common Core. <laughs> 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 Whatever was decent education has just really flown out the window the last few years. So. Yeah. Well, and I guess that's why we see so many people flocking to homeschooling. It's so many people will recognize that. Mm -hmm. So what would you say, I mean, working with so many parents like you do, the biggest obstacle that you see that parents have, and what is something that they can do to get over that obstacle and learn from that? Well, this isn't exactly an obstacle, but the biggest problem I see right now is that over the years, of course, homeschooling has gradually grown. It came partly Partly it grew out of the free school movement and whatever. It just kind of grew slowly over the years. And most people that came to homeschooling had a lot of time. They, they sometimes were even thinking about it when their children were first born. And they would read about it and they would learn about it and they would determine if it was really the right thing for their family and all this sort of thing. And then very gradually they'd ease into it. Now what's happening is a whole bunch of people... Uh, are just suddenly finding that they can't stand the public school for their kids anymore, you know. Yeah. And so it's like, oh, yeah, watch this. And they pull their kids out. And they know nothing about homeschooling, zero. You know, they've never read a magazine article. And uh, that's very difficult thing to do. But the number one thing that I would tell these folks that are brand new is that you just don't blow a lot of money right away because the number one thing they think they need to do is run out and get a curriculum. You know, and the, the yeah. comments that I'm hearing right now are, this is exactly what they say. Number one, they want to know what curriculum to use. Number two, they want it free. And number three, they want it all on the <laughs> internet and they want it all done out for them. And I'm here to say, you want to do that? Fine. But your kids will not wind up being educated. That's not what education is. Education is connecting with people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you do that by reading to them. You do that by getting to know them, by setting goals. And like I said before, if you're going to buy something, you carefully consider what your goal is and what your child's you know, learning style is and all that stuff. And you make sure, and if they're old enough, you let them have a big say in what you're going to be using. And then you go buy a piece of curriculum. What I'm seeing is they want the whole thing all laid out for them. They hope to have it free. Well, you know, it's, there's the old, you know, you get what you pay for, you know. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, there are people who've been working in this field for years and years and years and developing themselves. And I'm not talking about myself here because, you know, what I do is nonprofit these days. But there are people who have been working and working and working for years and years and have great, fantastic things laid out for them. And, of course, they're not going to be free, you know. <laughs> they, yeah. they put a lot of effort into it. And But people want to go for the free the stuff much of which is, you know, laden with advertising and so forth and not necessarily well thought out. And, you know, you could homeschool without buying anything, you know, but not by going to a free website or something, you know, and thinking that that's somehow going to do it all for you. I'm not saying you couldn't make some use of things like that. You know, I, I'm using part of the duolingual right now for the uh, free language instruction that they have. You can use things like that, but if it's not grounded in your, in your own goals and your own, you know, family and what your needs are, then what I'm already starting to see is all these people that jumped into it, bought all this stuff, tried to homeschool, tried to look exactly like a school, set up their school room, you know, get up at eight o'clock, turn into a teacher, you know, start with the Pledge of Allegiance and all this. And now one year into it, they're saying, I can't do this. And, and I would say to them, of course, you can't do that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it'll burn you out. right? <laughs> if you want to do that, go get an education degree and get a job, you know, uh, and, and be a teacher. If you want to be at home with your kids, you got to find a way to do it in a way that fits with a family approach uh, to, to more education. of a uh, more of a a better home life too you know exactly. <laughs> you can't keep that up <laughs> and and one book that i would really recommend it's uh, pretty new he just wrote it a few months ago is by chris davis um and it's called gifted um raising children intentionally and chris is has a philosophy very similar to mine and he's been around also since the beginning of the movement doing things with a company used to be called his company used to be called elijah company their catalog used to come in the mail and it used to be one of the number one things that we all used to wait for in the days before we were bombarded with other people's stuff. Anyway, but his book is really good. And it's all about that, of being a family and, and recognizing that, 
the character and who they are becoming. He, he wrote another book once that was called something like uh, The Angel in the Marble, because I think it was Michelangelo or something once said that when he was doing a statue, he just starts chipping away at the marble and he finds the statue that's inside. I, I'm probably paraphrasing that badly, but but the idea is that your kids are born with certain giftings, you know, and, and that book is called Gifted, but it's not about, quote, gifted children. It's about that everybody has giftings and our job as parents is to help them discover those, you know, and our job is not to make sure we cover the entire curriculum, scope and sequence of the public school. If that was working, it would be working. So, <laughs> yeah. so, we well, need to find something new. <laughs> and homeschooling is cheaper than necessarily what the public education is uh, costing our, you know, communities. But yeah, you do get what you pay for when you're not willing to compensate some of those people that have put the time and effort into. Those are great, great advice. Before we go on, let us take a minute and hear about our sponsors. Ready to homeschool your children, but you have no idea where to start or how to do it? Already homeschooling, but you're running into problems, or maybe you just want to improve results. Are you an expert homeschooling parent looking for every possible angle for your children? The Homeschooler's Handbook, written by an award-winning teacher with over 40 years' experience at every level of education, has the tools and answers you're looking for. Use the link on the LuminousMind.net podcast show notes page and buy your own copy of the Homeschooler's Handbook today. Welcome back to The Luminous Mind with Mary Hood, the Relaxed Home Educator. So with this relaxed homeschooler group that you've started and then with your own children, what type of successes have you seen with that sort of paradigm change in your home education? Well, my own kids, I think the beauty of homeschooling, uh, before I get into that, I just want to say something, uh, touch on something you just said a minute ago. I just want to say you can homeschool totally for free. You know, you can homeschool for the price if there is such a thing for a library card. All right. It's just the question of that. It's it's not you're searching for free resources. You're educating your children. Yeah. You're looking for the right materials, maybe. Yeah. And if it was me, I would spend more money on things like zoo memberships and trips to museums and experiences. And again, going to the library a lot and reading, 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 you know, but you can certainly blow thousands of dollars on curriculum materials if that's what you want to do, but it's totally not necessary. So, you know, as they get a little older, I tended to buy a few more books. I usually had a had a math and a science book, you know, by the time they were high schoolers. But but you really can do it for free, but it's just a different mindset of how you're doing them. Now, getting back to what you were just asking, the uh, to me, one of the benefits, many benefits of homeschooling is that you can really treat your kids as individuals. You know, my kids are all extremely different people, and they've all been able to find themselves to find their um, their passions and their talents and so forth, and I'll be honest, they're they're not necessarily you know marching off in a typical manner into their uh, adult lives. <laughs> some of them, <laughs> some of them more traditional possibly than others, but they're all extremely different folks. My middle daughter wound up uh, she she I think she went to three different colleges before she finished uh, started out at a Christian school didn't like the atmosphere at that one and then went to another one as an art major and then realized that she wanted to be more quote passionate about her art so she wound up going to a art college up in Michigan but then she went in as a you know I think she was a photography major when she went in and she came out as an art history major and then she was thinking about going to um, to do a master's in restoration work or something like that and so she started looking into England and while she was she remembered that years before that she'd been corresponding back when she was a musician uh, she'd been corresponding with another musician who lived in England so she you know she 
basically got in touch with him to see, you know, if he could help her make the transition to finding a master's program and wound up getting married to him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, she, so she's in England. So they've all just kind of found their own way into whatever they're doing. My oldest son almost had a geology degree. In fact, in a few places I wrote, I said he did have a geology degree because he was so close and I thought he was going to finish. And then he got cancer when he was in his 20s and oh, wow. that kind of waylaid him. And then he had struggled with some bankruptcy issues and things like that. And he eventually went back, finished a degree in philosophy instead. This was the boy who at 12 years old could not write a letter to his grandmother. <laughs> and <laughs> he was also the boy that at six could read Jules Verne. So he was, you know, different educationally. But the point is, he at one point he couldn't write at all. And then he graduated with a degree in philosophy where you have to write many, many deep thinking papers. <laughs> and now he's brewing beer. <laughs> 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 and he's happy as a lark doing it, by the way. Um, you know, my, my other son um, had a degree in Christian education, and he and my other daughter both uh, were working at a Christian international school in Korea for some years. The two of them especially have done a lot of international travel. Everybody's, I've heard so many times, man, that Mary Hood and her family, they must be really be rich because their kids go all over the place. Uh, <laughs> and let me just say that I have never, I have never spent a dime on my kids' travel. You know, they've They've earned that all themselves, one way or another. I, I'm planning a trip right now to uh, Germany and England in a couple of weeks, and uh, I've been asking Dan, my middle son, all, all for the details because he's run all over Europe, you know. And he and Ginny were down in New Zealand, and they worked in, did missions work in India, and Ginny's been on the Great Wall of China, you know. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> My kids have been all over, and I've just started doing some of that myself. I never did when I was younger. But at any rate, so so they've really had the opportunity to find themselves to be the individuals and, and really are, are finding what I would call their purpose in life, each one of them. And they didn't – my generation you – know, we, I went to public school. And I went to public school at a time when nobody was really encouraged to think very much about – why you were doing stuff, you just kind of went, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and so I follow I, society, you know, this way or that way. I always said my my brother is. Let's see, if I'm I'm turning 65, so that means he's almost 67. He'll be turning 67 next week, and he's still trying to figure out what he wants to do when he grows up. You know, that was just our generation. We we never were encouraged to you know to think, think about, about it. That. We just did stuff. You know, we did it because it was set in front of us, and I became a tremendous. I was tremendous behavior problem in high school myself because my creativity just needed an outlet you know and if I wasn't getting it educationally then I had to get in other areas <laughs> <laughs> so you know I, I took a pretty good sized detour before I wound up getting some some focus to my own life uh, but that was back in the 60s and a lot of us were doing a lot of detours back then so. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny that's great. So what personal habit do you feel like parents need to kind of adapt to be able to be successful at a relaxed homeschool <laughs> attitude? Well, I think the number one thing that I try to get people to do is to start recognizing and challenging the assumptions you're operating under because most of us have those assumptions from public school so that every time you get the feeling gee I have to finish this book by the end of second grade or gee I have to really worry because my kid is three years behind in reading comprehension on the standardized test anytime you get a any idea that relates to education just stop for a second and say now where does that come from and is that really necessary and is it really what my family is all about is it what I need for this child and this situation and so forth and if it's not you know lose it one of my favorite quotes is uh, from the book of Matthew Mark and Luke all, all have it but it's the idea of you don't put old you put, don't put new wine into old wineskins well you know when you try to take this new wine of homeschooling and cram it back into the old wines of institutional schooling and you know and try to do six different subjects for you know four different children four different grade levels with you up there at blackboard you know and, and little desks lined up in a row and buying all this heavy duty curriculum or using free curriculum that may or may not be you know right for your own family it just doesn't work it doesn't fit you know the wine bursts out <laughs> yeah. and, and one of the best things you can do is to listen to your kids you know if those kids are acting bored if they're acting like they hate homeschooling and they hate this workbook or something it don't just 
view it as some kind of behavior that you need to squash, but but ask yourself why, what's going on. And now, I believe in boundaries. Don't misunderstand me. I believe in well-disciplined kids with boundaries in place. I believe in consistency and discipline and all that sort of thing. But you have to respect them as the individuals they are. And uh, if you're just trying to cram one brand of education down everybody's throat, you, you get what I got. <laughs> you know, my right. education, I, I never really, I, I don't feel that educated. I have a PhD and any genuine education that I feel that I've gotten, I've gotten since I stopped studying that. I just, I'm not saying I didn't get some things out of it, but you know. But, but maybe where it's it's not forced, uh, all of a sudden it sticks. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, I, I'm I'm learning German right now, and I'm totally focused. You know, and I've learned so much in just six months. And uh, and I and I took German for two years in high school, and <laughs> probably don't remember any of it. You know, it's just it's not really education until the person is internalizing it. You know, and uh, and you people and principals and teachers and parents have been trying for years to just jam stuff down into a hit. There's there's an old Calvin and Hobbes cartoon I I used to love where he was going around in an on an assembly line with his head opened up and people were pouring things into it. <laughs> you know, and then the very last thing was of him like a fish flopping around until he got home. You know, and then he became himself again. So he, the idea was he was a fish out of water you know until he got <laughs> home so you know just that idea of, of working with your children in a family setting reading a lot you know making sure you're really focusing on the things that really matter just as an example in the schools these days social studies is just indoctrination you know and, and stupidity I hate to say it uh, all you have to do is look at a third grade you know a standardized test in the area of social studies to see what I'm talking about and that's not even new to common core that's been like that for a long time but you know what's you have to ask yourself what's important you know important things are understanding our history and our our uh, constitution and bill of rights and how our government functions and and learning about other countries and lands and other points of views and so forth you know all of those things you just have to keep keep asking yourself what's really important do we care what the capital of South Dakota is you know not unless you're going to South Dakota you know <laughs> so if you want to learn geography learn it with puzzles and you know by by taking little trips and things like that you know and using interesting travel videos to learn about other parts of the country and you know planning trips for pretend if you can't really take them but but the point is it's just just education and school setting is so dry and by the way, I um, I went to um, substitute teach for a while in 2007. And if anybody's interested in reading that, I wrote a um, a book called God Free School Zones, kind of a take on the whole drug free school zones thing. It's a it's just a PDF, you know. It's not even a real ebook. But uh, if you go to our website uh, and yeah, I think you make a donation of any size and just ask me for that for that book if anybody wants to read it I wrote a lot about what I see going on in the public schools these days and this again was written before Common Core and since then it's even worse and I also have a talk on Common Core that you can also get on our website it's, uh, it's, you can get it on either CD or MP3 so if anybody's interested in my thoughts on Common Core and <clears throat> how it may or may not affect us and what's going on and all that sort of thing I, I've, I've written and talked about those things too no, oh, great. And and you're saying that the PDF is called God Free Schools and you God, get that by God Free School Zones and you just go on our website and make a donation of any size and then what I would recommend since I've got several things going on right now there uh, is to use the contact me button and just tell me hey that's what that was for. I want I want you to send me that PDF. Okay. That's great. That sounds like an interesting read. <laughs> so, and you do have quite a bit of information on your website. I noticed there's all kinds of, uh, of course, you were a like I said in the bio that you wrote for the what old schoolhouse magazine. So lots of stuff mm -hmm. like that, and lots of PDFs on other things. It sounds really wonderful. So well, I, I also have my own e newsletter. Uh, it's been going on for about a year and a half now, and all the old copies you can read for free on my website, and you can also also read back issues of the old schoolhouse not just me but everybody by going to their website which is uh, theoldschoolhouse.com and you can then you click on magazines and you click on back issues and you can read to your heart's content so that's that's one of the things I would really highly recommend that new people do read as much as you can about things like that and some of that reading is free there's also good books at the public library some of John Holt's stuff is still good some of it's dated and it's sort of secular so that will appeal to some people and not to others I love everything he wrote except the book Escape from Childhood when I think he lost his mind for a few months while he was writing that <laughs> and then 
Uh, Raymond Moore, of course, uh, wrote Better Late Than Early and the more academic one, School Can Wait, and lots of other good books. And he was somebody that influenced a lot of us at the start of the movement. Also, something that most people would not believe that I would recommend <laughs> called The Continuum Concept by Jean Leadloff influenced me a lot in, in the early days of my parenting. It's just kind of the idea of carrying your kids around with you and giving them a little more freedom, you know, not, I guess, the opposite of what what they call helicopter parenting these days. It, that one, uh, it, as a Christian, you would have to filter that one because some of it you're not going to like. <laughs> but uh, but I, that book said a lot to me. Chris Davis's books, both the uh, the one about the marble, I forget the name of it exactly, The Angel and the Marble or something like that, and then his newer one, Gifted. So there are just a lot of good books for you to read out there and read those articles on the old schoolhouse. You can read my old newsletters, and if you contact me, I can you can get on my um, e-newsletter list. I just sent one out this yesterday, actually, just to really learn about all this. And, you know, even if you think you know what you're doing, even if you say, okay, well, I've picked Classical Conversations or I've picked Bob Jones, University Press or something, you still need to familiarize yourself with all the opportunities out there because what works this year might not work next year. You know, what works with one kid might not work ne- with the next kid. So you really need to know all your options and uh, and just know there's no one right way to do this. You know, I don't claim that my way is the only right way. This is all about loving your kids and uh, turning out good quality people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes we forget uh, kids are children or, you know, mm-hmm. that they are people. Children are people. <laughs> anyway, and that um, they have feelings and desires and passions and gifts that God gave them, you know, setting them upon this earth and type of thing. So, that that reminds me, one other person, uh, Charlotte Mason's ideas, she influenced me a lot. And the best way to, to learn about that to begin with is For the Children's Sake by Susan Schaefer Macaulay, who was Frances Schaefer's daughter, I think. That is addressing what you were just talking about, that uh, the people, are, the children are people and deserve respect and uh, deserve what, what uh, Charlotte Mason called meat instead of twaddle in their education. So uh, she was another one that influenced us a lot, a lot of us. So. Oh, I'm I'm writing it down right now. Yeah, so. yeah for the children's sake, Susan Schaefer Macaulay. Mm-hmm. That's great. Well, and I love talking to uh, seasoned moms like yourself that give us some hope. But, you know, if, if our child isn't keeping pace with what some of their peers in public school are doing, that somehow we're failing, that that um, maybe we're allowing the curriculum and, and the child to learn for himself and that someday down the road that they'll they will surpass or prove us to be correct that we were right (laughs) in our choices so that's great so before we say goodbye do you have any final parting words of advice and then please give us your contact information of how we can go ahead and get all those that wonderful resources and pdfs that you were talking about my main advice is be a mom don't try to te- turn into a teacher. Get out of this mindset that it's all about the curriculum you're using, you know, and, and really get back to the way you worked with your kids when they were very small and just treat them as individuals, set your own goals, get to know who they are, have an interesting life, do lots of projects, go places with them, you know, and uh, and don't waste a lot of money on a lot of materials that you really don't need. Like I said, I homeschooled my kids probably all the way up to about age 12 without spending hardly anything on curriculum at all. And even in high school, uh, probably the only things I had were a math and a science book. And all the rest of it was still, you know, done through library resources and so forth. So uh, just just don't and and don't don't be afraid because, you know, we have an enemy (laughs) and the enemy would love us to all be afraid and feel inadequate and everything else. And, you know, that's not what this life is all about. You know, you have to, you know, pray that 91st Psalm over over whatever you're doing and uh, and. (laughs) <laughs> and trust trust and believe there's so many people who are getting scared these days because of what's all going on in the world and you just have to remember that your home is an oasis and your children as you said before they deserve a childhood you know just drives me crazy when people think they should be showing their children all these awful things that are happening everywhere else in the world and all this you know they still deserve a childhood they deserve you know to play outside and to have a loving home and on all that sort of thing and if you provide that you know, you're, you'll be doing 
a wonderful job. And, and if you happen to forget to teach them, you know, I, did, I didn't even teach. When my daughter, Jenny, was about 14, she asked me what a noun was, and I told her. <laughs> and I think the next year she asked me what a verb was, and she's the one that was going off to college at 16. So I said, you know, Jenny, I really don't want you to go off to English 101 and ask these particular questions. <laughs> <laughs> but the point and, and she and she's a writer you know she she wound up with an english degree so <laughs> this, this is not people are focusing so many times on the minutia and the things that they, again if, if there's one thing i would recommend is just like i said challenge those things challenge your assumptions so just keep asking yourself what's really important and for the most part what we were taught in public school is not what's really important what's really important is out there somewhere else you know in the in the quote real world and when people talk about public school being the real world i just have to laugh you know it's <laughs> <Yeah>. just <laughs> that is the last thing that it is in the real world so anyway as far as contacting us there are several things first we do have the website archers for the lord it, that stands for the association of Christian Home Educators. So it's uh, www.archersforthelord.org. Um, we also have a Facebook group that's called Relaxed Homeschoolers Archers. And if you can't find it, you can always friend me. I think I'm Mary Hood One. There's a picture of me standing at a podium, and then I can invite you to it. Be sure you have more than one picture on your uh, Facebook because, you know, I get these requests from, you know, Joe Schmo that then says, you know, <laughs> she has three friends and they're all marketing things. So, you know, if you're going to friend me, <laughs> There's something on there I can see. You're all thinking you're, you're a real person. <laughs> exactly. yeah. And then uh, if you want to email me directly, uh, my email is mary.e.hood at gmail.com. Um, we are trying to start up some programs again, and I just would like to say that we are a nonprofit organization and we need help. Uh, so if you ever have any donation, tithe, stuff that you'd like to send our way, or if you just would like to get some, uh, we actually have a promotion on our website right now where for $25 donation, you get my whole eight volume set of MP3s, uh, the Relaxed Home Schooler Workshop set, in addition to four talks that Chris Davis and I did together and my common core talk and you get you get entered into a drawing for a handmade quilt so <laughs> some want to take advantage of that but anytime you donate or buy anything from us it goes into our programs and uh, we're really trying to possibly as you said at the beginning even start a small sort of a private school kind of wouldn't look like any school you'd ever seen but you know a private school slash resource center for homeschoolers again just getting going again like i said after a hiatus of about six years so i also do speak um i, I again people don't exactly remember that anymore so. <laughs> but i used to do a lot of relaxed homeschooling workshops and uh, speak at the fairs and so forth so if anybody's interested in that there's a there's a part on our web page that gives information on me as a speaker and so forth also so I'd be happy to come out and start speaking around a little bit more again. And I also speak on Common Core uh, if people want me to speak on that. That's great. Thank you. I love what you talked about, how how we played with our children when they were young and think about how much they learned, you know, just in those play times. And then all of a sudden they turn five and <laughs> we're trying to march them off to be a real person type thing. You know, we, yeah. want, mm -hmm. we end the play right there. So great advice. Well, thank you so much. I really do feel privileged uh, to be able to have you come on our podcast and to talk to parents and to encourage them. Definitely check out Mary's website and how we can donate. I love donating to new private schools. I'd love to see as many of those flourish as possible. So mm -hmm. give her a call. So thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Mary Hood and to get all of her links and information, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and consider joining our program by going to the scheduling tab to become a fire starter today. Help support the podcast by making all your Amazon purchases through the free Amazon widget on our website. Also, sign up to receive two free audiobooks from Audible at theluminousmind.net. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Google+. Get our audio content on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider telling your friends about us. Leave us a review. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 